This is a picture of a pair of gargoyles, griffins, uh, mythical devices that were sent to me by a friend who's a prop maker and he was saying, I've done lots of wiring looms from the past. He said, could you make me a custom wire loom just for my own use because I'm putting these out in my garden and they're going to have a little solar panel at the base and the I LED eyes are going to glow red. So he wanted something that was going to make it very easy to get them down the inside. He can make a hole up the middle of this because it's a foam core that's then going to be coated to make it resilient and give it the finished texture and sort of stone-like appearance. Uh, but it, he can poke a, a screwdriver in and get a hole into the middle, but it's quite hard. It's not something you could get your hand up to put an LED from the back. So what we're going to use is what I've used for other props from in the past, and that is these little rubber grommets. And these rubber grommets are available from uh, a company in the UK called Rapid Electronics. They cost uh, about 10 pence each, and the stock number is 55-0295. And one of the nice things about them is that you can either feed them from the front and then press them into a hole, or... If you make the hole just the right size, you can actually push them from the back uh, so you can have a quite a complex wiring loom and then it just gets fitted in. And that's why I use these a lot because uh, the prop making industry is such that rather than me spend a lot of time on the set uh, or the in the workshops trying to build the electronics into finished props, it's much easier just to send the wiring loom and then it just gets built in. So here's what I'm planning on doing. I'm planning on getting two one meter tails of twisted wire. Twisted wire like this. Now this wasn't twisted to start off with. Uh, I'm going to put the LED and the grommet at one end and I'm going to use one of these little connectors at the other end. Just soldered on, bit of sleeving over there and then the sort of uh, the alignment uh, thing and latch and then the pin out the middle. And when it goes back to the solar panel it's going to be a standard little garden solar light but it's going to have a couple of tails coming out at red and black. One of them is going to go to one of these little sockets. Uh, one's the other socket and then there's going to be a loop between them so both red LEDs are going to be in series. It's just the easiest way to run it from our solar light. Now it's worth mentioning that the, uh, the wire is standard red and black uh, instrument or wiring equipment wiring cable and it's uh, got seven strands of wire and has a total cross-section layer of about 0.2 millimetres uh, square. And uh, the, all the statistics, it's 1.2 millimetres in diameter, the cable. Um, it's rated for 2 amps. Uh, theoretically, the insulation is rated at 1 kV. I think that's probably its test voltage, but uh, that is its rating, apparently. And it's about £6 for a 100 metre drum, and that lasts a very long time. So standard equipment wire, stranded. And to make it twisted like this, because it's very hard finding stranded wire like that as twisted pairs, what I do is I put the two rolls at one end of a long room and I pull the wires off to the other end. Then I use this device that I made, which goes into a cordless drill, and it's a piece of printed circuit board material, and it's got a long bolt with uh, spring washers in the middle to grip it tightly and dead centre. And then it's got these soldered on generously blob, blobs of solder at both ends. It's got crocodile clips. And what you do is you put that in the drill with the clip there, clip there, the bar. And I found, initially I thought I could do this by just folding the wires up and stuffing them in the end of the drill. But, well, hold on, I'll draw the drill. Let's draw a very crude drill type thing. Yeah, something like that. Mm -hmm. That doesn't look a bit like a drill with a big battery in the bottom. But, uh, I thought initially I could just stick them up the ins inside of the chuck and tighten on it, but it didn't work. Um, I used to make a lot of this. Uh, I used to make huge batches of it for, for this uh, prop making work. I found that if you did that, uh, one core would just stay static and the other would spiral around it. So you'd end up with a very odd arrangement. It, it wasn't like twisted like this. And uh, using this bar to do it uh, keeps them separate and you pull it out and then you grip it. With your just gently with your fingers, and then you spin it. And another important thing to note is you spin it for quite a long time because it, you can see the spiral going along it, and then you have to keep spinning it. This time I did not because I was doing it in a sort of dark room and it wasn't uh, clear just how much it was twisting or not twisting. I didn't want to go too far. But once you've done it uh, and you've got really tight twists on it, you take the wires out, but you keep a tight hold on. If you let them go, the, it would just instantly it would coil up and spiral round itself you have to actually carefully let the let the tension just release slightly and it will spin a few times and then you'll be left with the wire 
uh, in sections that has a good rough twist over it. Not such a great twist there, but how it's it's good enough. It's holding it together. It keeps it coherent. Right, let's uh, get this out of the way and let's start doing this. And while I'm doing this, I'm going to be answering more of the questions and answers because it's the perfect sort of situation to pass the time. So the LEDs. I'm thinking because this is going to be outdoors, I'm going to actually put a tiny blob of silicon grease at the end of this. And I'm not sure how well this is going to work. I've never done it before. But we'll find out when I do it. Here's the silicon grease. I was actually looking for the silicon grease there. I didn't realise I had it lying out. Let's uh, get a screwdriver and thoroughly contaminate it with silicon grease. What's the one that I don't... Right, tell you what, we'll use this flat blade driver. And I'm just going to put a blob. I really don't know how well this is going to work. It's probably going to make a huge mess. I wish I'd got a paper towel handy. But I'm going to put a blob on either side at the back of the LED. And then I'm going to just experiment. Let's try the first one. This is going to squish everywhere, isn't it? I'm going to feed it through, and the grommet has two holes at the back, which the leads go through. And the stuff will squish out the back, probably. Maybe. Don't know. So it's gone in. Uh, it's squished out the back and it's all over the fingers. That's okay. Just one moment. I'm going to grab a bit of towel. That looks like it's working okay. So what I'm going to do now, to note which lead is which, I'm going to do what I normally do when I do this. I'm going to cut the short one kind of short and the long one, the positive, just a little bit longer. And then I'm going to fit this into... Uh, the helping hand here, because in this case it, it actually re really does help. And this is where the helping hand is not going to grip that properly. That's okay, I shall use the metal prongs. That's going to work better. Now, I'm trying something different with the soldier iron. It's quite buzzy because it's got a transformer in it. Uh, and just to see what how much of a difference it makes, it's on the shelf that the camera is mounted on the edge of. And in the past, it's created quite a bit of a buzz through the camera. And I didn't realise before how much that transform vibration was coupling through the shelf. So I'm just going to strip this with uh, these. Uh, so I've got it on foam pad, making sure there are no ventilation slots. These are my favoured junior wire strippers, traditional wire strippers. I shall just uh, take my hat off. I don't need my hat on at the moment. So I'm going to twist these wires. I'm going to touch them with a bit of solder. I'm going to touch that bit of solder, but I'm also going to put a bit of... Uh, heat shrink wire, heat shrink sleeve over these. So I'm going to slip it over the cables and then push it well back. Technically speaking, I could have done this before I trimmed the ends because sometimes it splays the strands as you actually try to do that. This is the prototype. This is me just testing how well this is going to work to see if the, uh, the solder is going to be affected by the um, silicon grease. I don't think it will be, but there's one way to find out. I should perhaps have cleared tools off the cable of the solder iron. Let's uh, give that a clean. Let's get that cable out of the way of the soldering white pad so it, yeah, it's cluttered here. A good busy bench is cluttered. So soldering that, soldering that. Looks good so far. And I'm going to put tin the red to the black and the red is going to go to the long lead and the black is going to go to the short lead excellent I'm going to make sure there's not too much he said absolutely squishing it everywhere uh, soldering that just to make sure it does uh, the heat shrink goes over no problem. I'm going to let the solder cool down a wee bit because if you push the heat shrink straight over, it just shrinks right there and then, and it causes uh, it causes slight issues. Uh, now I'm going to get my heat gun, and once again, before MD asks, it's part of the same soldering station, uh, the Yahua 8786D. I've never used this for its intended application of reflowing surface mount components. One day I will do that. That looks pretty good. That's one of the lights uh, on. So let's uh, do this connector at the other end and the same thing's going to happen. I'm going to cut these leads the same length. I'm going to slip over a bit of the uh, heat shrink sleeving. I only need about three-eighths of an inch, 
10 millimeters ish We'll slip that over, and this is where I'm going to strip it now. The heat shrink sleeving promptly slides right back off. I'll get to the questions and answers bit uh, when I've uh, got the first one of these done, because uh, then you'll know what's happening, and uh, we can then just answer questions while I just continue with the rest of it. So, uh, usually I mark these which way around it's going to go. Uh, it's going to plug in like that. I tend to make the one on this positive. Where is the one? Are these connectors different, or am I just completely missing, missing that? Okay, I'm going to make this a uh, positive. Where's the uh, sharpie? I'll either find the black or the red sharpie first. Whichever one I find first, it's going to be the one that uh, is the polarity mark. It's the red. Okay. Right here, I'm going to mark all these like that, just as a reminder of which side to do the positive. Usually I have one stuck on uh, the, uh, the other helping hands, which uh, just to remind me, when I do a lot of these connectors, which way, which polarity I use. That'll do. I'm going to sit this in the helping hands. I'm going to use the... Uh, one with the heat shrink sleeping on it this time. Actually, I don't really need to because it's not going to damage anything, is it? It's quite a resilient thing. And I've got the heat shrink sleeve on this, so I'm just going to tin everything, including the wires, and uh, flow onto that connector. Technically speaking, I could have zoomed in this, couldn't I? It might have made it a bit easier. To see. Right, and the red, I'll do the black first, which is onto the back. I just usually lay it on top and then reflow it briefly because otherwise the pin can actually get soft in the plastic and move. And that, once the heat shrinks on, so make sure I don't leave a wee tail on that with solder. That's uh, it. So that's the first actual one of the LED strands made. I shall just put the heat shrink over that. I've got a wee tiny peak in the solder, which I'll just crop off with snips, just before I slide the heat shrink over that. The heat shrink's really just to stop things shorting out. Uh, I'm not sure how to make it waterproof in the base of this. I'm not sure how much water is like to penetrate in. I don't think much water will get inside that gargoyle, but then again, it's uh, out in the outdoor weather, so who knows? Time will tell, and uh, things like this are usually fixed once uh, once the bulk of the work's been done. Sometimes I suggest uh, putting some Vaseline or something on these connectors. If they're out in the open, that lasts for a certain time, but in inevitably water does get in. And that is it. Excellent. Right, so I shall do the other set of these, because that looks like it's working okay, and we shall answer some of the questions. I should just throw that down the floor, that's better, so out the way. Right here, let's uh, zoom in just a tiny bit so you get to see a bit more of what's going on. And we'll answer the questions. So let's uh, stuff all these uh, LEDs in. Let's get the silicon grease in. And the first question is, have I travelled the world much? Now, I'm not sure if I answered some of these questions before. I don't think I got to these questions. I remember, I sort of like, I got through about half a sheet of questions last time. Uh, have I travelled the world much? I've been to Germany, I've been to Holland, I've been to France, I've been to America, and I've been to Australia. In Australia, I went to... Uh, Perth. I stayed in a place called the YMCA. It was a sort of hostel type place, but uh, it was when my uh, mother was just starting to go into Alzheimer's and we just thought, screw this, let's go, lots of holidays, let's take my mum everywhere before, before it's too late. I strongly recommend doing that if you can. Once the first signs of Alzheimer's appear, which is people losing a bit of their vocabulary, just words start disappearing. So we took mum to 
uh, Australia. The YMC place was actually lovely. We got a sort of family room, which had more beds than us, which was quite handy. It was nice and spacious. Really nice location. Perth was very sunny, as Perth often is. And I went and explored Perth itself. I didn't do the touristy things at all. There's one bit I really liked in Perth, and it was uh, the Fremantle bit, the sort of docks and the sort of harbour. And it's, it had the sort of usual seaside stuff, it had the sort of uh, amusement arcades next to it, which was quite good. And a sort of market with food outlet in it. Yeah, quite like that. Then we went on to Melbourne, and my brother chose the accommodation this time. He said, we're not going to another hostel because that's what peasants choose, and he chose a place called the Nunnery. And we went to the nunnery, which was an old nunnery, but uh, it had been used as a private house, I think. And it was kind of a hostel, but we got the private room type thing. And it was a lot much more expensive. I'm just going to grab this because uh, my fingers are getting a bit slippy with the grease. And uh, we, at the time we got there, they just bought the place next door and were doing it up. And yes, it was not the nicest of places. The mould in the bathroom was quite significant at that time. They really had just bought the place over and hadn't done it up yet. But it was acceptable. Uh, things I liked about Melbourne. I liked uh, the I liked Victoria Market. It was quite interesting. And I liked uh, Luna Park, obviously. The, the fairground uh, sort of theme parky type thing. Yeah. So we spent about, I think it was a week or so in each. Uh, it wouldn't have been much longer than a week. We also, while we're in uh, Melbourne, visited an uncle who lives over there and his family. Which was nice to actually meet up with them. Uh, France, well, Disney. So, I uh, saw quite a lot of Paris. Um, and that was it for France. We did travel, though. Uh, when we had time off at the weekend, we'd uh, go to places like Parc de Sciences. It's a science park in a... Uh, uh, France. It's very, very good, actually. It's uh, lots of interactive exhibits and buttons to press, which is kind of important in science parks. They had this amazing thing that you looked into it, and it showed you the inside of your eye. It was some weird optical thing. It was really big, uh, and you could see everything floating about inside your eye. You don't realise just how much stuff in your eye there is that's floating about. It's quite freaky, actually. But, uh, get this in there and strip the wire and puff it on I may do what I normally do now and uh, just do all the LEDs at once and then all the connectors at once it seems to be a wee bit faster I'm not sure if it's faster or not doing it that way getting into a little pattern so I'm not sure how that thing worked I know that sometimes when you go to the optician they check out the back of your eyes with uh, the little handheld thing, you can kind of you can see at a brief point you can see a reflection of your eye from that. But this thing, its sole function was to uh, create the, the the reflection of the back of your eye. I've lost the little thin heat shrink. One moment. That's fine. I've got plenty now. So if you know how that thing works, uh, it'd be quite interesting. Leave a message in the comments. Because uh, it was really interesting looking into your own eye. A bit freaky, actually. Uh, other things in France. I loved Fr uh, I loved Paris. Once you go over the fact that Paris actually smells a bit. It seems to have sewage problems and there's prostitutes everywhere. And chancers and weirdos and mimes, obviously. But I liked it. I liked it a lot. I really liked the French because they were so characterful. They they didn't take any, you, they didn't take being messed around. They were quite defiant. You know, they stood up for their rights, which was quite good. I liked the fact the transport in France was very good because it actually ran for sensible hours. You could get home uh, if you stayed out late at the weekend enjoying the nightlife of Paris. You could actually get home okay. What did surprise me was the amount of vandalism, graffiti, which seemed a common thing in uh, Paris. All the trains were coated inside with a sort of peelable sheets that, you know, once, the, once they'd uh, gra vandalised it with graffiti, all they did was peel off a layer and stick a new one on. Like some sort of kindergarten 
picture roll type thing like that, which is probably pretty much what it was. That uh, rolls on actually, that question. I could mention uh, I was uh, visited Dusseldorf in Germany, uh, a few places in Holland while I was travelling with the fairground, and uh, uh, let me see, where, where else to go? Um, America, mainly hanging around about uh, Las Vegas and Florida. The trashy bits that, you know, people like me would go to. Busman's Holiday. I guess get this just pauses momentarily while I'm soldiering this connection on. Flux would help here. A little touch of flux just to make it flow better, but it's absolutely fine. Yeah, looks good. I shall do all the heat shrink sleeve at the same time, so uh, I shall go to the other end of the... Uh, I'll do the LEDs first and then do the connectors. Okay, next wire. Next LED into the vise. Yeah, uh, drifting on into the, the Paris bit, working at Disney, someone was saying, what was Disney like to work with? Without upsetting Disney, what was the most challenging thing about them? Not creative management. Right. Okay, right. Uh, Disney, I went over to Disney expecting it to be a big American corporation, and it was exactly that. It's fine. Vivid memories of arriving at Disney. It, it was actually one of the first times... I'd, well, actually, it's not the first time I've been... I brought, it's the first time I've been in France, and... The, there's a slight language barrier there because uh, a lot of other countries speak a lot of English. But the French speak a, a fair amount of English, but they, they're not, it's not easy if you don't speak any French. So fortunately I had a smattering of French. It turned out I had more than a smattering of French. All the stuff that was taught at secondary school came back and it was very useful. And as long as you can get some words, you know, uh, it sort of gets the message across. Uh, the Disney management, yeah, it was odd. The original creative Disney that you'd think about uh, with the Imagineers and artists, that's still there, but there's a layer of management above it. The guys that they call Imagineers are young people who have basically wanted to work at Disney, so they come in, they're pretty much given the Imagineers hat straight away and then put under huge pressure. They really are given massive quantities of responsibility. Uh, the people, the older Imagineers are interesting because they're the ones that are seasoned and they're more laid back. Um, and then you have the people that do the real design and they're called the creatives. And it's a standing joke, and you'll know that this, uh, this is the joke inside Disney, that if a creative drops a pencil, don't bend down to pick it up. Because... Uh, a lot of the people who work in the entertainment industry and the, some of the most creative are gay. It just it's the, it's the same in all areas of the entertainment industry. It's just how it is. They just seem to be the most creative that way. It's very odd. When you uh, look close to that, you realise that a lot of the best theme park rides were quite heavily gay designed. It's just how it is. I'm not sure why that is. It, that affects just about every area of the entertainment industry. It's strange. It's just a, a standard thing. It kind of fits in with that uh, thing that, you know, there's more than one type of human. Some are designed to breed and some are designed to create and uh, invent and do all the technical stuff and all the artistic stuff and entertainment. It's just that strange scenario. So Disney, yeah, good experience. I do remember uh, going in the, the, the sort of big back gate and meeting our uh, our host, Peter, who was a, a British guy who'd been working with Disney for a long time and his job was to basically meet the new contractors from across and uh, basically act as translator if it was needed. Although we did get a Peter Zigadler, uh, we got another guy in as a sort of dedicated translator with us who was also doing technical work because he was based in the sort of entertainment industry again. And uh, my first uh, experience in Disney was at uh, the site canteen where they had just the most incredible site food, food ever. I mean, I'd, I'd heard about the French cuisine being good, but something simple. I went in and got myself a uh, baguette de jambon salade. I'm not sure if that's 100% correct, but, you know, it's uh, basically a ham salad baguette. 
and went outside while I was waiting and just ate it and it was like suddenly it was this explosion of flavours in the mouth. It was incredible. Oh, here's here's me doing that thing that I'm supposed to be... Uh, I'm supposed to be waiting until I've done all the LEDs. Oh, I am, actually. That's fine because I... Uh, no, it's not fine. I'm just completely screwing up here. Where is the last LED? There's the last LED. And after that, it was just a complete, you know, uh, the food was amazing for uh, contractors in that place. They had, it was also the first taste of European regulations about not working people to death and, you know, giving people a life. So uh, Northern Light, uh, who I was with at that time, had tended to have a policy. Their guys tended to work seven days a week. 12 hours a day, it was just work, 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 work. And they tried to do that at Disney, and uh, the Disney guys said, nope, you can't work uh, more than eight hours on the Saturday, which for us was half day, um, and uh, you're not allowed to let them work at all on Sunday. They're going to have the site shut. Everybody's going to be off. And uh, it was great because I, I just saw so much. It, basically, the weekend started at, at uh, about uh, four o'clock, on the Saturday, 4 p.m., and uh, a lot of the contractors, the French contractors, finished at lunchtime on the uh, Saturday. It was just that it was like we called it the Cinderella effect. It just suddenly everybody was gone at the stroke of lunchtime. It was just empty. You'd see like things like forklift trucks with their little beacons still going round and round on them, just abandoned, and that was it. They'd gone. Strange. We went round, turned them off. Yeah, good times. Strangely hot. Really, it was like sweltering a lot. I don't know if it was that's normal, but uh, certainly the times you we were over there was just like very, very hot. We're working at uh, a porter cabin preparing the lights, and it just uh, got really too hot inside. Even the doors wide open, it was uh, absorbing the heat big time. Right. Uh, but uh, I got offered a job by Disney full time. Uh, on their maintenance department, but I actually declined because I just didn't really want to end up uh, working over in France all the time. Also, I thought that uh, they were perhaps the enthusiasm of the younger Imagineers was uh, they were tending to use sledgehammers to crack nuts, so to speak, in the technology, and it meant a lot of their stuff was just stuffed with PLCs, and it was just too much to go wrong, actually, in a lot of the stuff. It wasn't optimized for reliability. Also, now Malak had short out a safety switch to get a ride going again. Next thing you'd know, it'd be this, some kid would be mushed into pulp inside one of the rides or something like that. So let's uh, slip the sleeve in over. But yeah, Disney, overall a good experience. Quite enjoyed that. Uh, a lot of the seasoned uh, Imagineers were fun to talk to. What else can I say about that job? Yeah, it was a... Uh, yeah, good, it was good. Let's uh, move on with, will the kitties make an appearance again? Okay, the kitties make an appearance every time I go outside the front door, but let me tell you about the local kitties that uh, have adopted me. When I moved to the Isle of Man to care for my mother, uh, I moved to this house, and every time I went out into the garden... There was this brown cat there in a tree. There's a sort of fir tree in the garden, a conifer. And every time I looked up, to, up into it, tree cat was there just looking at me. And I thought, that's strange. It's almost like it was quite scruffy and it looked like it lived in the tree. And I had the horrible feeling, what, what if the previous occupants had just left or died or something like that? And that was the cat that lived at the house. And round about that time I saw a poster in the local vet's window that said, uh, have you seen these cats? They're missing. And uh, I said, oh, that's them. That's uh, the brown cat and the little black and white kitten that later later made an appearance. And uh, I phoned the, the number on it and told them that uh, they were here. And the woman said, oh, yes, I know. They, they treat my house as a hotel. It's terrible, you know. And it was like, oh, take the sign down then if, you're, you, know, if you know where they are. But um, they obviously didn't settle in. They were stray cats that had been rehoused. And they're spayed, uh, they're neutered, well, spayed is the correct term, because they're both female cats, to stop them uh, having baby cats. 
And uh, so that's that, wearing them done. Uh, so they, they just hang around all the time. They live in uh, my neighbour's garage next door. And we kind of look after them. They kind of, I get the feeling they've adopted most of the street. So they do make appearances. So uh, the brown cat, the fluffy brown cat is the mother. It's actually called China, which is a strange name. I don't know how they got their names. And the kitten, uh, I'm guessing she was found in a hutch or something as a stray. She's very feral. She, uh, very difficult. She accepts a bit of petting now, but she's quite, at the beginning, she was very shy because she kind of grew up in a rather harsh world. Um, uh, she's called Hutchie. And she's, she likes company. She likes hanging around with you when you're out in the garden. And lets you stroke her a bit more. But if you try picking her up, she hisses because she's just not used to that. She's not used to human contact, let alone suddenly hoisting her into the air. Her mother, China, has obviously been a house cat at some point because she's, well, sort of used to getting picked up and petted. I've already put soldier in those. Let's put soldier in these. Uh, next question. Oh, is the UK plug-in socket superior to all others? Well, you know what? It's not necessarily superior to all others. It's an ugly big plug. But when you look at the way it's designed, the person who designed it, designed it to be rugged and safe and make a good connection and have built-in protection. It's actually... For all of the fact it's big, chunky and ugly, it's actually quite easy to wire. It's very robust. The cable grip really holds it. Holds it. The cable, the plug doesn't just... That was the camera just restarting the next half hour section. Uh, you can't just grab a cable with the British plug in it and pull it out the wall. It won't happen. You'd cause damage if you pulled it hard enough. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's very rugged, it's very well protected, it's well rated. They do occasionally uh, burn up a bit. Sometimes uh, loose wires inside, sometimes a bad connection into a socket. Sometimes the uh, fuse makes a bad connection inside. But on the whole, they're pretty good, even when grossly overloaded. They're a, a good, robust plug. So that's that uh, one done. Now we're on to the last of these looms. And the picture is going jumpy. Oh, is that going to affect... Uh, is it just... That's uh, that's annoying. That's the camera rebooted. It's quite warm in here. What's the temperature in here? It is currently 25 degrees Celsius, but this... The Moto uh, G5, uh, G4 Plus is... Uh, it's very quirky. I've mentioned this in another video recently. It's uh, Hopefully it's not affecting the quality of the video it's recording. I think they've updated it to death. I've got the fastest possible memory card I could find it to rule that out. And it's not too hot tonight, although it's been running for a while. Uh, I have noticed, uh, well, a friend's got one as well, and uh, he was saying his is getting a bit bumpy as well since the last updates. So I get the feeling uh, Lenovo have done something. Is it time to look for a different phone? The snag is, I heard an audio sample of the more recent uh, Moto G6. Uh, it was a sort of video sample with outdoor uh, recording, and it was just absolutely terrible. The, the sound was all that digital, sort of synthetic, garbly type noise you get in the background with some uh, of the sort of sound compression when it's not handling the, the ambient sound levels. Yeah, I hope this isn't making the image all jumpy. That's quite annoying. I tried another uh, phone that I've tried in the past, a uh, 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 Wiley Fox Swift, and you know the sound was really good and the video was okay but it seemed over compressed the video. The image of the bench when you looked at the video you couldn't see this texture, this pattern, it was just a mottled fluff in the background. It lost detail. And I want as much detail as possible, obviously, because everything's a bit fumbly. I'll just keep plodding on. Hopefully it isn't affecting the uh, quality of the video it's recording. Hopefully it's uh, giving priority to sticking that onto the memory card. I'll find out when I play it back, I guess. 
In that case, you know what? I may actually, since it's already stopped and start again, I'm going to actually pause now and I'm going to let that cool down, so I'll be back in a moment. One short break to allow the phone to cool down, and it should have caught up by now. I reviewed the video footage, it didn't look like it jumped, although it kind of slightly jumped when I was looking at it, but I think that may have been the playback, which is an issue with the Moto G4 Plus at the moment. Hmm. So these are uh, solar garden lights that are going to be used as a generic little uh, power source for these. It's, it's not really going to be too high power, it's just going to be a gentle glow. The request was that they aren't too ferocious, you know, really intense. They're just a gentle, subtle glow to make you actually wonder, is that glowing? So uh, we've, I've put some, uh, taken the metal sleeves off these, I've put some of the all-weather tape over it, the ultraviolet resistance. It's tape that's designed for repairing greenhouses, and then I've slid the sleeves back on again. Look at that as well patch of sort of rustiness. Uh, sometimes, if this isn't pure stainless steel, or even if it is, sometimes if you contaminate it with actual steel, it can actually result in that. That might have been part of the manufacturing process that contaminated the surface. Hmm, interesting. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to remove the LED and uh, solder a couple of wires in the place of the LED. And the wires are going to be long enough in the context of the, uh, the statue. It's going to be facing into the sun. This little module is going to sit down at the bottom here, and then the wires are just going to go un underneath and into the body. So, uh, yeah, that, that should work. So I've, I've left about a foot, 300 millimetres, on the wires. So I'm going to start by desoldering the LED, but as a precaution, let's uh, note what's going to where. So this is positive. OK, and the negative is going to... The battery negative. Okay, that's easy enough to remember. So to desolder this, I'm going to wet those solder joints. Let's get in a little bit closer. So I'm going to wet the original LED solder joints with fresh solder. That just makes it easier to desolder them. Then I'm going to step back as and forwards between them until the LED pops out. I could use a desoldering pump to remove that, or I could use desoldering wick. I'm kind of back on to using the desoldering wick at the moment, uh, which I, I didn't actually think about this beforehand. I've misplaced it. One moment. Yeah, that would do. No harm, there's plenty of desoldering wick. And I can see the flux pen, which is quite handy, so let's... Uh, Get this out and uh, add some flux, and I'll moisten the wick with some flux like this, uh, and touch it onto the solder joints as well. And when I apply the desoldering wick, it should make a hiss noise and suck that solder up. Oh, pushes it down into the solar light. Oh, that's uh, nicely done. Wick getting very hot very quickly, as copper does. Talking of uh, wick and heat absorption, while I was a uh, Changing the screen in the Moto G4, the one that I broke the screen on and replaced it with a non-compliant screen that's introduced noise onto the video, which is why I'm not using that particular uh, phone at the moment. While I was doing that, part of the uh, common instructions on the uh, on the YouTube for changing the screen was to just slit a black sort of sticker, a black label on the back. And I was thinking, is that an RF antenna or something like that? Or is it maybe even a heat sink of some type? And it was a graphite type sticker. When you tried peeling it off, it delaminated and left the graphite underneath. It turns out that that is a heat sink sticker. So cutting it uh, removed some of the heat sinking ability to... It looks like it dumped some of the heat into the battery, which is quite odd. I suppose ultimately the process isn't getting super hot, so it's not going to dump enough to uh, cause an issue. But it looked like it was actually using the battery as some sort of thermal mass just to absorb some of the heat. That's a bit shady, isn't it? I'm sure they know what they're doing, though. So I've soldered the black wire in. Let's solder the red wire in now. Aim it into the little spot of light I see coming through here. And solder. And I'll solder both the wires in before I uh, start crimping terminals on because then I can turn the solder iron off and that gets rid of a bit of the humming noise in the background. It does make quite a buzzing noise, that solder station. Not super loud, but it just seems to come through in the camera quite a lot. I wonder if my acoustic isolation has had an effect. 
So let's stuff everything back in here. Um, t if I was actually installing this myself, I'd bypass the switch as well, because the switches are always a bit of a problem uh, in terms of uh, rusting inside me a bad connection. But I don't want to do that at the moment because uh, it's not in use yet, which means that the lithium cell would be discharged. Lithium cell? Nickel metal hydride cell. And if you over discharge them and just leave a load across them, uh, it can uh, cause problems in the long term. It causes creepage of the electrolyte and causes corrosion of the contact. So that is one terminated. Let's get the other one and do it now. This should be slightly easier. Different screw. Oh, both of them are different screws. The other ones are countersunk. These are round head. That's odd. That is not coming out. Let's uh, grab a pair of pliers and pull it up. There we go. wonder if that was jammed in a wire or something. I'm not sure. A bit of corrosion on the battery terminals, but that looks like it's been caused by the aggressive flux they use. Uh, because to solder with uh, lead-free solder, the flux is really quite nasty. So the positive of the LED, I'll just mark that again so that I don't make any boo-boos is that one. The positive is right next to the screw, that's quite handy to remember. So let's uh, moisten the solder with fresh solder. Fresh juicy lead based solder. And then alternate between the two of them and the LED pops out. Bit of flux, bit of desoldering wick and we'll get the solder off those pads. So I'll just splosh some on like this. Generic eBay uh, wick uh, flux pen. Generic eBay so desoldering wick. Everything on eBay. Which makes it slightly frustrating that the American government and shortly probably to be followed by the British government are clamping down and putting huge import tariffs on Chinese imports. They're not really thinking of the implications of the fact that we use it for educational materials and prototyping materials. But then again, they are politicians, so they're not really all fee with stuff like that. All they're interested in is money. Bastards. This is why we have electric chairs. Uh-oh, don't say things like that. If I designed an electric chair, it would be absolutely amazing. It would have digital readouts, it would have fairground lights. Uh, although it wouldn't need them, it would have smoke machines for extra drama. It would be like a Halloween prop, but with politicians in it. And lawyers. Not all lawyers, just the ones that uh, screw society over for their own personal gain. People who are non-advantageous to society. little bit of politics getting in there. I don't normally do politics. Let's stop the politics. But vote for Big Clive and uh, yeah, that would be just exciting. When the military suddenly got repurposed closer to home. So I'll solder this in. And that will be the last of the solder connections needed in here. Jolly good. Excellent. And off goes the Soldier iron, so that should uh, take a little bit of 50 hertz hum out of the equation. Right, let's uh, pop this back into the base here, making sure I don't trap the wires. If you look at that sculpt of the uh, griffin, whatever they call, gargoyle, whatever, I have to say, you go into the prop making companies and these were just sculpted freehand out of foam. Both of them, and they're pretty much identical. Or there'll be slight subtle differences, often deliberate differences, just to make them different. The guys that work in these companies, uh, that's John of uh, the Quickening in Glasgow, John Riddell. Uh, and another one that comes to mind for huge sculptures is just Steve. I don't know his second name, just Steve. And Steve just takes a huge block of polystyrene and just turns it into a perfect replica of anything he's looked at, or does it from his memory. And it's just incredible watching them work. It's just, you couldn't believe that these guys just basically are like a sculptor, but they just do it routinely every single day. They're amazing. They're so artistically skilled. They, I don't think they realise how artistically skilled they are. 
So now I'm going to strip the ends of these. And I've got to crimp on some terminals. I'm stripping these a wee bit too long, but not to worry, it doesn't really matter. It means that it'll be protruding a bit further into the connector than normal, but it really doesn't affect its operation. And onto the tool, this tool that I got from uh, Rapid Electronics, again. I'm not, uh, all this stuff I tend to get, a lot of my materials from Rapid Electronics or CPC, mainly Rapid Electronics. Bit miffed that they're charging a high surcharge to Isle of Man these days. But, uh, Rapid have always been my favourite supplier, to be honest. They're a very down-to-earth, you know, components for factories type of company. Just down-to-earth pricing, you know, just sensible bulk pricing uh, if you want to buy a lot of components. And this thing, uh, when I was looking for a suitable connector for making prop wiring looms, this came to mind. I tried, thought I'd try it out. This was quite an expensive tool, but not as expensive as the Molex one. And I have to say, when you first get this, it takes a bit of getting used to. You have to crimp several connections. Initially when I got it, I was like, oh no, this is taking ages. Uh, but it's all right. It's not that bad once you get used to it. So the negatives go into one terminal, the positives go into the other. Now I'm going to make a little loop with more crimps, uh, which will go between those two connectors. And then we'll give it a go. And then I'll make the other one and... And some more questions. I don't think I'll be able to answer many questions the time it takes to do it. But we shall see. Feel free to ask more questions in the comments down below. At some point I may do a live stream because I'm going back to the uh, land of internet. Hmm. We've got, I've got 4G over here, but uh, unfortunately the company that provides me my 4G internet connection uh, was oversubscribed. And they're no longer accepting people for that because uh, the, um, what do they call it again? The I've forgotten that word for that. When you're sharing it with lots of people uh, and uh, it's resulted in very, very slow 4G internet speeds. Damn, why have I forgotten that word? That's annoying. I keep, it keeps surfacing the word as well in my mind. And I, then I forget it again. When you've got multiple people sharing one connection. And the, uh, they often uh, advertise their services. You know, you can pay more for a sort of lower... It's not contingency. I've, I've just forgotten what that is. And several of you are now shouting it at the screen because you know exactly what I'm talking about. Anyway, let's uh, try this out. Let's bring a loom up with the LEDs. I would bring a loom up. What have I done with the, with the LED looms? There they are. And let's see if I can, uh, oh, let's see if I can answer one of the other questions, which is, what's the most valuable lesson in electronics? The most valuable lesson in electronics is, people make mistakes, it's absolutely fine. Don't worry if you make a mistake, it's absolutely fine. The LEDs are glowing ominously. That's perfect. And when I pick this up, they go out, and when it gets dark, the LEDs are going to come on. The eyes are just going to have a subtle glow that says, I am an evil monster. Right, that's perfect. That's uh, the first one done. Let's stick the bootwick out the way. And let's uh, do the next one, which uh, I need this, and I shall pull these to roughly the same length, crop them level. I'm still trying to remember that word. You know how when you forget a word and it really, really bugs you because you really, you shouldn't forget that word? Yeah, that. It doesn't matter. It's fine. I don't need to remember that word right now. It will come. As soon as I stop making the video, I'll remember it. Uh, next question. Have I answered this one before? How are you with knowing how many viewers use your videos to get to sleep? Uh, a lot of people use my voice in the background as a sort of sleep aid, or they watch the videos and they fall asleep. Never the same thing. I think it was a Mike's Electric Stuff video a while back that I just could not stay awake watching it. And every time I woke up, it was like, oh no, now I've got to rewind and uh, see where I stop. But uh, I'm absolutely fine with people falling asleep watching my videos. It's, uh, it's good, that's just an extra bonus because I don't have a problem with that at all. If you find it somewhat soothing, let's uh, 
crimp this off. What about the next question? Worst product I ever built. Really? Uh, the worst product I ever built was an attempt to make a budget fairground light controller called Fader. P-H-A-D-E-R. And I just didn't like it. Because when people say, oh, can you make something cheaper? and Can you make it cheaper, cheaper, cheaper? And you end up you end with a product that is unsatisfactory because all the safety features that protect the components, the, the sort of people who want something done cheap are the sort of people who are not going to wire things right and will blow a controller up. So uh, it had things like it drove the tracks directly from the output of PIC microcontroller, which uh, meant that when a track really blew up, when people bypassed the fuses of tin foil and stuff like that, it took that out. Also, uh, it... The controller, the fader, as the name implies, it did dimming as well. It was an attempt to look like a, one of the European type controllers that uh, fade the lights as well as chase them. And uh, it had, that added a lot of expense complexity to it because it had big chokes inside it, big toroidal chokes and uh, suppression capacitors for the noise that not everybody else uses, but I just thought it would be the right thing to use. And uh, that added a lot of weight, and it also introduced a problem with the inductiveness from the chokes. Uh, with what I used were snubberless triacs, which were supposed to not need a snubber, but in reality, they do need a snubber. It was a bit, uh, yeah, that was learning, which meant uh, I had to change the circuitry quite a bit, and uh, I was never quite happy with it. It was just one of those uh, things that uh, it just didn't really click. It works fine. It does the job. It does lots of clever dimming effects, but it was just... For the amount of effort, it just wasn't worth it. I prefer to stick to the sort of pay for a bit extra, get a decent controller that's going to just last for ages. And many of my controllers are still going strong decades later. Right, let's try this one out. Oh, look at that. Perfect. Glowing evil gargoyle eyes. So there we go. That is what's involved in making a custom loom up. It, you know, it's quite time consuming particularly when you're blabbering all the time and talking about stuff. But uh, it's time-consuming to make uh, these up. I used to make, I used to just sit and make these hugely complex looms up with microcontroller uh, circuit boards with microcontrollers on them and just rows of connectors so that when it went out on site, it meant I didn't have to be there. It saved time in the long run. It saved them money in the long run because uh, it meant the prop makers could finish the prop at their own leisure, drill all the holes for these, put the LEDs in, and then all the connectors were labelled. They could just plug them up and everything just worked. Never, ever had a problem with that. It was very good. But yes, I'm also I'm going to upload this video when I get back to the UK because uh, uploading it here via the 4G connection will be very slow. Uploading it by 3, 3 is 4G with its blistering 26 megabit upload speed and its uh, whistling 50 megabit download speed. Uh, 3 is my preferred UK provider. It's, uh, they're, they're just great. They're very relaxed, very sensible pricing. Oh, it sounds like an advert for three. Uh, it's a, a just an interesting company, three. They've got an interesting history with lots of different networks that they've built the networks up and then they've just moved on to the next one. It's, it's very much an engineering company, very interesting company. But the one they've stuck with is, uh, at, at the moment anyway, is three, which was originally a 3G network, one of the first ones, and then evolved to 4G. But they're just a sensible company. I can use my three sim anywhere in the world I can uh, with including data and it, it's all sensible pricing it's just it's it's how it's how mobile phones should be I wish all the other companies would follow suit instead of just trying to claw and dupe you into contracts and things like that but anyway have I answered almost all the questions there I think I have oh the last question is why fronts or briefs well the answer to that is loose cotton boxer shorts for maximum comfort Having your testicles cupped in sweaty fabric is never a good idea. Oh, to actually, you know what? I'll answer one more question. Most unpleasant dirty job I've worked on? Would it be the fairground? Would it be working down tunnels and things like that? I've worked in steelworks. I've worked in underground flooded tunnels. I've worked under water towers where I had to wear waders and wade through uh, deep water while pulling cables, making sure that everything was isolated before that. Uh, the only one that's really manky that comes to mind was when I had to then go down a very narrow tunnel with big pipes, water pipes, and they were all covered in denso tape, which is super gooey and sticky. And uh, I had to get new overalls after that. But really, uh, sewage pumps and stuff like that. And it's just, you know, it's just dirt. It's just work. It's nothing really, you know, I, I can't really say I've ever worked in what I'd call a really dirty and unpleasant job. If anything, I'd rather do a sort of dirty, unpleasant job in the fact it keeps all the safety people away because they don't like getting dirty. And also, um, 
the least pleasant jobs have been on building sites where there has been a high health and safety presence and you've got people going around just looking for things to grind their axe on. So uh, that's the most unpleasant jobs. It's not dirty, it's just political. Yeah. But anyway, that's that job done. Now I'm going to deliver this uh, when I get back to Glasgow over to John and he can fit it into his gargoyles at his leisure and they will glow. Oh yeah, see, as soon as I stop the video, contention ratio is the word I was looking for. That always happens. I can never remember videos, words when I'm making videos and then the video ends and it's like, oh, that's the word you were looking for. That's so common. It's just the pearl of, uh, pearl of recording stuff. It's what happens.